it's Lizzie. Today I'm going to talk about how to lead a Bible study. So I have been leading Bible classes and small groups since I was in elementary school and I always refused to use the pre-planned material and I just made my own Bible classes. At this point, I'm in my mid-20s and I've led so many Bible studies throughout my life that I really nailed down how to create a tight community and prep a series that's very intellectual and depth going into the Bible. And not just this kind of theological fluff where you go around and you're like, what does this passage mean to you? How do you interpret it? I've been in Protestant Bible studies before where there's zero prep that goes into it and the leaders don't really do an introduction of what you're doing but more just open it up for discussion so it's really important with leading a bible study to get the perfect balance of lecturing basically and discussion so starting off most bible studies in small groups start with a lot of people who don't know each other so in the first session and maybe the entire first semester it's really important to have icebreakers to get to know each other. Now these can be really cringy and awkward, but the one that I use that works really well and I don't feel as cringy at all is called Table Topics. I'm gonna link it below and you can get them on Amazon and they have a lot of questions that have so much depth to them. I feel like I'm saying depth a lot, but it's important to have a lot of depth to what you're doing for a Bible study. So anyways, there's so many questions in them. It's all over the board and you really get to know each other really well in a way that isn't awkward because definitely a lot of people when meeting new people for the first time don't really know how to interact. And I think it's really bad if you immediately are just like, let's start Bible study. Let's start reading Gospel of John right now. Chapter one, let's read, go Bible study. You really wanna create a community. Preferably before you even start the Bible study and do table topics, you should eat a meal together. In my college, we had something called house groups and we would have a meal in professor homes. They would prepare it for us. But also my senior year in my Bible study, I prepared the meals for my whole group in our dorm room. So if you're in college or if you're a young adult, you're totally capable of making your own meal cooking for people. And you can even ask everyone to chip in like $5 or do like a revolving thing where everyone signs up on a different week. This is the exact same way that my parish Bible study is. Someone's in charge of getting takeout and then we all donate to the meal. At one of the colleges I work at where I do campus ministry work, we just eat in the dining hall for an hour before. So try as much as possible to do a one hour eating together, building community before you even get into the Bible study. And at the very beginning, you can do table topics while you're eating, but hopefully a few weeks to a month in, you can just eat a regular meal and have basic conversation together. So after you eat, you get back to the Bible study and I really recommend doing it in a living room or a family room that has really cozy seating. Obviously you can just do it at a table, but I find that the atmosphere is really, really important. And so if possible, you can make it feel home-like, especially when students are in college. I think that's really important to just develop a more intimate dynamic in the group. So starting off, do some table topics rounds if you haven't already done it at dinner. Do three or four rounds. You can go around, share your answer. It's really quick and easy. After that, my absolute favorite is doing highs and lows. So everyone goes around and shares the best part of their week and the worst part of their week. I think this is the most amazing thing and it forces you to get to know each other on a more vulnerable level. And one of the most important things for highs and lows is either yourself or someone else who you know needs to start by adding a lot of vulnerability and sharing things that are more intimate to who they are. And the first person who talks or the second or third person who talks kind of sets the mood for how intimate everyone's gonna be in the Bible study. Cause it's not just head knowledge. You also wanna share your life experiences, how it applies to what you're currently going through in life. And so try as much as possible to be the one to open up all the way, strip bare and just share things you're dealing with. I'm very open about my mental illness. I talk about how I have bipolar in the first or second session. And I think especially with college groups, so many people suffer from mental illness. But also if your parents are going through a divorce, if you just had a really bad breakup, 
if you had really bad roommate problems, anything having to do with relationships where things are hurting right now, that's a great way to open up and develop that vulnerability where everyone feels safe to share things with each other. So after you do highs and lows, you can actually get into the Bible. Some people start with prayer, but I like ending with prayer instead, but obviously it's up to you. You can just start with like a one minute prayer and pray over everyone and just ask for God to guide the discussion and give you the best words to speak before you start opening up and kind of lecturing on the Bible. But if you just ate a meal together, you probably already prayed over the meal and so you don't have to do a double prayer if you don't want to. So now getting into prep work and what the Bible study actually entails. So I recommend if you need a Bible study leader for your small group, to pick someone who has some experience studying religion. If you don't, you can still follow my tips and do the Bible study well. But I found that at my college, some of the people leading the small groups who had not studied religion or understood how to have different hermeneutics in interpreting the Bible, they kind of just were like, let's read the passage together and discuss what it means without starting with this head knowledge lecture of objective ways to understand the passage. And I'm serious about this. There are objective ways to understand a passage. It's not just everyone's interpretation for themselves. That's very Protestant. And I've been in Protestant Bible studies like that. But even if you are Protestant, you do not have to resort to that. So starting off, the easiest thing is to get a commentary. Right now, for my Bible studies, I'm using the Jerome Biblical Commentary. It has the entire Bible in it, from Genesis to Revelation. So definitely invest in one of these books. But, I mean, right now, since we're dealing with the pandemic, it's a bit difficult. But go to your local library, especially if you're in college, or even if beyond, just go to a university library. They will have an entire religion section with loads of commentaries. And so pick a commentary. There's lots of great Catholic commentaries. But I also use Protestant commentaries when leading Bible studies now because they're not total trash, you know what I mean? Like, obviously Catholicism and Protestantism disagree on really important things, but there's a lot of other things that we agree on. So don't completely ditch any Protestant sources is what I'm saying. So just pretend that you're in school and take notes outline everything that the commentary is saying and what i do is i create a google doc and in my last video i uploaded i showed how for romans which took several months i had 110 pages in my google doc of notes of everything that i read and questions that i came up with so you need to make it really depth you need to do a lot a lot a lot of research it does not need to resort to fluff how does this passage make you feel so next, I really recommend using Church Father commentaries. Yes, as Catholics, we have complete access into hundreds of homilies and sermons through the years, through the past 2000 years of how Church Fathers and Saints have interpreted the Bible. Especially in the early church, we have homilies of how the earliest Christians are interpreting the Bible which is way better than any commentary, although a lot of commentaries are based on the church fathers, but it's way better to just go to the primary sources. So my go-to is Chrysostom. I absolutely love him. Also, Origen has a lot of commentaries as well. Augustine does. And the most amazing thing is that they're free online to access. New Advent is a website. I recommended this in so many videos. They have basically every primary source you could ever want from the early church and beyond on their website. They have Aquinas' entire Summa on there. They have Church History by Eusebius, which is my absolute favorite book. So definitely whatever book of the Bible you want to study, there will be homilies on New Advent of church fathers, saints interpreting it, which is so important. Currently, I found this book series. It's kind of expensive. This was $40 but it's worth it and I get paid for my campus ministry job so I'm investing in the students. So this is a series, they have the entire Bible and they collect church father commentaries 
from dozens of saints. So listen to this commentary and everyone who's in here. So it's mostly based on Chrysostom, Bede the Venerable, and Eriter, but then it also has Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianus, Gregory of Nyssa, Ephraim the Syrian, Didymus the Blind, Athanasius, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose, Irenaeus, Cyril of Alexandria, etc. So this thing is amazing. So many of these people are in the first 400 years of Christianity. They're so much closer to the apostles and to the oral traditions of how to interpret the Bible. So obviously this is preferable to any commentary and preferable especially to any Protestant commentaries written recently based upon the historical critical method that aren't based upon early Christianity. Although the historical critical method which is when you look at Greek or Hebrew etymology and understand the culture at the time of the Greco-Roman Empire and Judaism at the time of Second Temple Judaism, that kind of scholarship I still find useful doing word studies and stuff, which I do do. So don't totally throw out historical critical method, but obviously preferably start with church fathers and saints, especially people closest. So I totally recommend this series and investing in one of these books. You can also use the Kindle PDF version online if you don't want to purchase the entire book. But I do recommend if you're doing a campus ministry position or even working at your college, a lot of times you can get money back from investing in materials for events. So this is something where you should send in a request to get refunded for since you're using it for your Bible study. And again, some college campuses might have this entire series in their religion section. So definitely go to the religion section. But I feel like this isn't in a lot of libraries, but go to your local one and see. So this series makes it so easy. I'm reading through the entire book this semester, taking notes on it. Just like how I told you to take notes on a commentary, pretend like you're in school, annotate the book, write around in it, take notes on it, and you have beautiful explanations of how to objectively interpret these parts of the Bible. It's so important. There are objective meanings of scripture. It is not how everyone feels. So then you can do this in several ways. You can spend five to 10 minutes at the beginning explaining what the passage means and then do questions discussion. But what I've been doing lately is going verse by verse and introducing what it means and then adding in questions. The questions part has come so easy to me but you can ask people how this would apply to modern times. You could do a Lectio Divina type thing. What is this saying about God? What is this saying about how we are to live as Christians? What is this speaking to how you can currently live out the faith in your life? So you can ask those three questions about the passage. So you started off with objectively how to understand these Bible passages. And now you can talk about questions on how to apply the objective meanings into your life and how to live out the faith based upon these interpretations of those Bible passages. Organization wise, I really recommend investing in an iPad. This one is really old. I bought it for my friend for I think $70. It was super cheap. I really recommend going on Bible Gateway, copying and pasting the entire chapter, putting that in the iPad so you can read through the entire chapter first with everyone before getting into it. Yes, so I forgot to say that at the beginning, start off before you explain the meanings by just reading through the entire chapter together. So then after that, I again paste the entire chapter and then I go verse by verse. So I'll be like verse one, church father interpretation of that verse, commentary interpretation of that verse, verses two and three, church father interpretation, commentary interpretation, question. So I do it like that and I literally go through verse by verse. So topical, I have done topical ones before. Before I've done in Ecclesiastes, a time to do everything, that chapter. And I've done verse by verse and done parallel passages and stuff. In last fall, so a year ago, I kind of did fruits of the spirit type exercise, some apologetics and did a different one every week. But this entire year I've been doing, just pick a book of the Bible, go through the entire thing, and you'll find that church father homilies and commentaries will reference all over the rest of the Bible. So I'm doing Romans, I'm doing Acts, I'm doing John. The commentaries and homilies will be like, this chapter in Romans is referring to this in Genesis. Then you can have everyone go back to these Old Testament passages 
and interpret scripture within the entirety of scripture. So that's what I really love about homilies and commentaries. They refer to all over the Bible. So you're not just looking at one chapter, but you're looking at everything. And that's what I recommend. One chapter per week, maybe two. It totally depends on how slow or fast or how many questions you want to ask. And for me, I always practice and I usually practice in front of a camera or in front of a mirror, reading everything, reading all my notes so that I'm not just like looking down the entire time, but I have it memorized in my head and I can look around at everyone as I'm talking. So I really recommend, my mirror is usually here, but I moved it to film. So I look in the mirror, I look in the camera, I practice, I practice, I practice. So I'm not just staring down the entire time. So how to end a Bible study? I always end in prayer. We do prayer requests. So a lot of people, when they do prayer requests, they don't actually write them down. So I tend to write down prayer requests and then actually pray for these people throughout the week. Some really cool ways to pray. Number one, hand out little pieces of paper. Everyone writes down one to three prayer requests, pass it to the right, and then the person next to them prays for their prayer requests. And you can talk for like a couple minutes explaining the prayer request before you go around and all pray for each other. Another thing is everyone writes down three things that they're thankful for and then three prayer requests and you go around in a circle and everyone individually prays for each other. I find that sometimes in groups they're like, let's share prayer requests and everyone just goes around popcorn style explaining what they're praying for. But I think it's more important and just moves faster and has more depth to what you're praying for. You pray in more detail when you write stuff down and either pass it to the right or are just praying for yourself rather than everyone like splashing out prayer requests and then one person praying and you forget everything that they said. And something else that I do is when you pass it to the right, that person prays for the person the entire week. So I think that's really important. Another thing I've done in the past, which I'm thinking about right now, I might start this up again, is doing prayer logs. I do prayer requests for the entire semester. I have a chart, date, prayer request, and then another column, answer to the prayer request. So I keep them because I know students, your friends can lose them. Put it in a folder, take it out every week, and they write down the date, their prayer request, and then throughout the semester or throughout the year, they will have answers to the prayer request and it'll be so cool looking back at that. So those are some ways to pray it out. I really encourage everyone to pray together. Praying out loud together is my favorite thing in the world. So I'm kind of biased, but I think it's important when every single person gets to pray together and just talk to God and share what they're feeling. Since I'm Catholic now, I also tend to end the entire prayer session with an Our Father, a Glory Be, and a Hail Mary. And we all say it in unison together. And then in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you're done praying and you're done for the day. I keep having to pray to make the sound stop outside, whoever's doing a leaf blower or mowing the lawn, and it literally has been working throughout the entire video. So comment below if you have any other questions about leading Bible studies in small groups, and definitely DM me on Instagram or Twitter if you guys are leading Bible studies, tell me how it goes, ask me any questions. If you want to be led to more resources to find church father, homilies, and everything like that, I love you guys a lot and I will see you in my next video. Bye!